I am strongly convinced that the Bible is the only authoritative guide for a Christian. The Bible and the Bible alone is the only authoritative guide for a Christian. Please understand what I'm saying and, and take it seriously. Now, it doesn't mean that we obey the Bible all the time. It doesn't mean that. In fact, if only those who obey the Lord all the time should be at this church, this church will be empty. If you disagree with me, you can say it out. Because I know I'm not perfect. My wife knows I'm not perfect. Now, even when you think you're perfect, you have some unhealthy evaluation of yourself. And that is why it's really important when we come to church when we read in the Bible, when the preacher is preaching, it's very important for you to hold them responsible to what the Word says. Because no preacher has authority. No deacon has authority. No official of the church has authority. The only authority we have is from God. And how does God give that to us? Through His Word. You see, we all think differently. But when it comes down to it, it's what the Word of God says. There was a time you could not come to church as a man and wear a hat and leave it on or even turn it upside down. You know, you know how they wear it today? There used to be some people in the church who smack you in the head. You come in with a hat on. You know? You see, but they didn't get that from the Bible. But it's just, as far as they were concerned, this is the house of God. This is respect. You come in, you should, you know, be respectful of the Lord and all this. And, and you know, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you know. And there was a time... When the preacher could not come to the pulpit, if he doesn't have a robe on, he must have a suit on. Even where I grew up in Africa, in the burning sun, I would see my pastor in three-piece suit. I never even thought something was wrong with that. Something may have been wrong with his head, but he had this tradition that, you know, if you're a preacher, you must be in three-piece suit. So what, what I want to bring us back today is let's look at the book of Galatians. And I want to look at uh, seven principles that we get from the whole book, the book of, 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 of Galatians. And I mentioned our Sunday school this morning because... The title for the message today is, Beware of False Teachers. If you read the book of Galatians and you're going to say you truly understood the message of the book of Galatians, what it is telling you is, Beware of False Teachers. And sometimes they come with you with traditional authority. But their tradition has nothing to do with what God is saying. I remember when I was in seminary, there was a young man here from Marin City who also believed that God had called him to preach and he was coming to seminary, and one day I was coming out of my class and he met me somewhere, and there were some of you know this young man, he's gone home to be with the Lord right now. 
and he met me in the parking lot. He said, Emmanuel, do you, do you hoop? I said, what do you mean? He said, I mean, do you hoop in your message? I said, what is that? I was playing like I didn't know. He said, well, you go, you got to hoop now. You know, if you're really a preacher of the word of God, he said, you, you got to hoop. I said, well, uh, show me what hooping is. And I said, I said, can you do it now? He said, oh, yeah. And by the way, he came, you couldn't hoop. <laughs> but he was trying to show me what, what he will do at the end of a message. You go, oh, Lord, have mercy. God, he, 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 I found him. I found him. I tell you. I said, I said, what's all that? Did Jesus ever do that? I said, well, you bending yourself out of shape and, you know, doing all this. I said, what is that? Did, did the Bible tell you you must hoop? He said, well, you can find it in the Bible, but true preachers of God have to hoop. And some buy into it, and people who don't, you know, if you don't have the voice to do that, don't make a fool of yourself. I had a Presbyterian preacher one time trying to hoop. Yeah, in Marine City. He, he went on and, you know, I said, what, what is he trying to do? And after the message, I call him to the side. I say, when the man has scissors. <laughs> he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to hoop like you. <laughs> we do a lot of things that has absolutely nothing to do with the word of God. Absolutely nothing. And the things that really count, we neglect them. So let's look at let's look at uh, the book of Galatians. Paul Paul is writing to the Galatians, whether they be Northern Galatian churches or Southern Galatian churches. Scholars are still arguing about which church he really addressed this to, but let's both agree he wrote it to Galatians. And the first point that Paul brings up is that the gospel. And the gospel preacher must be sent by God. If you look at it, it's very clear in the book of Galatians. It said, Paul, an apostle, said not from man, but from God and by the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel that Paul is preaching is not the gospel that is made by man. It's not the gospel that depends on hooping. It's on the Word. It's the Word. By the Word. What Paul is saying is the gospel is never man-made and the proclaimer must be sent by God. How shall they preach Unless they are what? Saint. How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the gospel. Read the book of Romans. How can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach without being saint? Let me tell you that many, many people today have assumed the call of God in their life when God hasn't called them. You see, in our churches, we have a problem. We have a problem when a woman gets up and says they're called to preach. We will accept any man without questioning them. It looks like we just say, well, if you're a man, well, God must call you. But then when a woman says, I'm called, then we start questioning And we forget that 
God is the one calling. Not you. Not me. It's based on the Bible. And I don't know why we are so dumb. The Bible already said, In the last days I'm going to pour out my, my spirit upon all men. And only men shall prophesy. Only men shall dream dreams. Hello, are you still with me? I'm not boring you, right? What does it say in the book of Joel? He said, your young men shall do what? And I don't want women doing nothing in the church. You see, that tradition is not based on what God has said in His Word. Because if you, if you base that on that tradition, if you base it on, I don't want to hear a woman. I don't want to hear a woman. And you know how they, some of them are so, I don't know. They say, well, Jesus didn't call no woman. Uh, do I have time? Yes. Fifteen seconds. I was well. Anyway, I don't want to go into that because that that will that will hold me. I still have I still have six points. But but the point here is this: that you have to take the Bible as a whole because God didn't give you half of a book. He gave you a whole book. And that is called the principle of interpretation. You have to understand what God is saying from Genesis to Revelation. Not from the Gospel of Matthew to Second Timothy. Forget everything else. You know how a lot of people, you know, we are really good. We are really good when it comes to our understanding of the Bible because we know what we know and we are just like that when we say, don't confuse me with the facts I already made up my mind. We are convinced about what we know and we don't want to listen to what else the Bible has to say. You can't just take the Bible as the New Testament. You've got to take the Bible as the Old Testament and the New Testament. And God has given you two books. Yes. Amen. 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 You tell some people, you know, God wants you to tithe. They say, oh, it's in the Old Testament. <laughs> oh, that's, isn't that in Malachi? Isn't that in Deuteronomy? Isn't that in Leviticus? Isn't that in Numbers? Those are old books. And the same people will say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You think that's in the New Testament? The gospel must be the gospel... From the word of God. It must, you cannot just come and preach anything you want. Are you listening to me? There are a lot of preachers on TV. There are a lot of preachers with thousands and thousands of people who just go there because they, they are listening to what their itching ears want to hear. A lot of these people are psychologists, not preachers. If you want to practice psychiatry, go practice it. Don't say you're a preacher. If you're a preacher, it's the Word of God. And if the Word of God says it, you must be honest and humble enough to preach what God says because that is not your pulpit. It's God's pulpit. Are you, I know I'm spending too much time on that point, but that is the most important point. I want to tell you, I, I said this in Sunday school this morning, and I want to repeat it again. When You need to pay attention to what your preacher is saying. You need to watch him closely. 
Because sometimes some preachers get too full of themselves. And don't say, well, our preacher won't do that. You don't know that. You don't know that. You need to watch everybody and make sure they preach in the word. Because that was the reason why thousands of people died in Jonestown, Guyana. Because they followed a man that was feeding them and helping them and doing all this. Because he started with the Bible, then he went into his own brain. And people listen to him. And that's the same thing Paul is saying to, 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 to the Galatians. He said, you need to understand this. If it is not coming from the word, don't listen to it. If somebody brings it to you, I don't care whether they come with wings. If they come to you and they bring this to you, let them be what? Eternally condemned. Can preach another gospel? You can tell people it's good for you. Your good time is yet to come. Your good days are ahead of you. You are a wonderful person. God is blessing. God is going to bless you. And don't tell them about sin now. People don't want to hear about sin. Don't tell them they should obey the government. Don't tell them they should not speed on the highway past the speed limit. Don't tell them they should not go after other people's husbands and other people's wives. Don't tell, don't tell them they shouldn't have sex until they're married. Don't tell them that people get all upset. Young people will stop coming to your church. I, I know my time is up, but I'm, I'm. I wish I could deal with this, but it's really important we understand it. It's the word of God. It cuts the preacher. It cuts the deacon. It cuts the members. God doesn't care about your feelings. It's the word. Second, how much time did I overuse there? <laughs> okay, second is, the gospel is universal. If you read in the book of Galatians and you don't get that, shame on you. Some of you say you read it, so I'm, I'm just bringing it back to you. The gospel is universal. I don't know why we are black church, white church, Chinese church. Mexican church, Hispanic church, African church, Jerusalem church. Pretty soon we're going to have cheese church. It's really amazing. And let me tell you, it's not that, it's not that you are spiritual or you're non-spiritual if you feel you just feel comfortable with people of your own race. You remember a guy named Peter? Paul said, before the Judaizers came, I saw Peter, he was living according to the gospel. He was having fellowship with Gentiles. He was doing everything with Gentiles. Immediately he saw the Judaizers. He said, oh, I don't, I don't want them to think I like Gentiles. And what did Paul say? Paul said, well, I must love him. I must not say anything to him. Paul said, I told him to his face. You know that it's not the gospel that Jesus taught us. You cannot do that. You cannot live like that. That's not the gospel that God teaches. You can't let people affect you the way the people that you live with, the people that you associate with. You know, you know the gospel is not discriminatory. 
Amen. Take it. God is telling us. And I say the time is moving fast. Nationality or race does not determine applicability of the gospel. It doesn't. I know some preachers are proof that Jesus is black. What's that got to do with the gospel? Well, I can prove to you that Jesus, but I said, uh, you must be reading uh, Louisiana Bible. <laughs> Using historical document from the Constitution of the United States or something like that. You're making it up. My time is up. (laughs) You're making it up. Anyway, let's move on to the third point. The gospel is not based on outward ceremonies and ritual observations. What is the word that the Bible uses in Galatians to tell us the gospel is not about ritual? Thank you. Circumcision. Remember that Paul is talking to both Jews and Gentiles, but especially to Jews. And he's saying, now, you know, why is it that we say we are Jews and we belong to God? Tell me. Why do we say that? Because of what? Who, who is responsible for that? Who was the first person? Thank you. Abraham. You tie your heritage, you tie your lineage to who? Abraham. Now tell me something. When God accredited righteousness to him, was it before he was circumcised or after he was circumcised? Before. I rest my case. So your faith has nothing, your righteousness has nothing to do with circumcision. And besides, what are you going to do with the women? You are looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. It's not about circumcision. It's not about days. It's not about what you're observing. It's not about, it's not about, I've been baptized. Some of you have been baptized, but you're just like a wet devil. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism doesn't give you righteousness. The gospel is Jesus alone. Period. Now, I'm I'm going to tell you something. If you're here today and you understand that you are a heathen, okay, I don't, I don't, I, I don't believe anything about the Bible. I just come here because my friend comes here. Well, I just come here because I'm looking for a boyfriend. Well, I'm looking for a girlfriend. Now, be, you know, be honest. I remember when I went to church first time, that was all I was looking for. I'm telling you. And, and the preacher would say, you better pay attention to why you're here. I said, he doesn't know why I'm here. He won't say that. <laughs> It's Jesus, period. It's about Jesus. If you're here and you don't believe in Jesus, I'm telling you, you are not saved. You're not saved. 
You can sit here Sunday after Sunday. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help you. Now, I'm not saying leave. All right. <laughs> Just sit there until your time comes. <laughs> but it's not about coming to church. It's not about putting your name on some road. It's about Jesus. The children sing it on Easter Sunday. They say it's not about Easter eggs. It's not about something bunny. It's not about something. It's about Jesus. He's alive. He is not dead. <laughs> Point number four. The gospel is not based on the observance of special days and traditions. Not only is it not based on outward ceremonies and ritual observations, but it's not based on special days. You know what? Don't die because they have a service on Saturday. A lot, many Seventh-day Adventists are saved more than many Baptists. Don't die today. Sunday is a special day because that was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. That is the reason, the only reason why we worship on Sunday. That is it. It's the Lord's day. It's the day that Jesus got up from the grave. We used to worship on Saturday too. Until the early church, the disciples said, this is the day that the Lord got up from the grave. This is the day that he has brought a new inauguration into the world. That is the day we should set aside to praise him and worship him. But don't die because of day. You can worship him on Wednesday. Amen. If Tuesday is your bad day, you can worship him too on Tuesday. You don't have to wait for Sunday. But remember this too, though. That we get it wrong when we think, you know, you just, if, if you worship God in your shower, that was enough. The Bible said, in the congregation. Amen. Where people can actually judge whether you can sing or not. (laughs) (laughs) Number five. The gospel is not based on good works. But it produces good works. We are not saved by what we do, but what we do proves that we are saved. We are not saved by works, but we are saved unto good works. Are you with me? Absolutely nobody here got saved because you're good. Now, if you were good, you didn't need any salvation. You can go wherever you want to go without being saved. But if you want to be saved, it's because you're being saved from something. You don't save a person if they're not in danger. I mean, you don't just come to me while I'm walking along the road and say, I want to save you. Say, from what? I just want to save you. You save somebody because they're in danger. If somebody is in a house that's on fire, you put a ladder there and say, Fool, get off the ladder! Come out! You save them! Jesus is saving us because we're in trouble. And that is why we need salvation, because we could not help ourselves. And do you know one thing also that amazes me is when I look in the Bible 
My salvation is not even based on the fact that I came forward. Man, I used to think I was, I was really, really doing something. You know, I came forward. And I, I, I never forget this. When I was first pastor of Village Baptist Church, and one Sunday, I priest preached up the storm, I thought. And at that time, we used to put chairs in front, the deacons put chairs in front for people to come forward, you know, when they're saved, when they want to respond to the gospel. And this guy came forward, he was crying, everything was going on, and uh, I should have kept my mouth shut. But I said, no, what was it that I said that really impressed you, that really got you to come to Christ? He said, I didn't even understand your language. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what you were saying. <laughs> I had absolutely nothing to do with that guy coming forward. But you see, I wanted to have some credit. And God said, I saved you even before you were in your mother's womb. Before there was ever a marine city, before there was ever an America, before there was ever Africa, wherever, I already saved you. So, you know, you see, you didn't do anything about it. But don't think that you can do anything you want. Paul said, if any man is in Christ, he is what? New creature. What happens? And the new has done what? Has come. The old folks used to say, when they, when they got said, they looked at their hands and their feet too. <laughs> Somebody say, I moved from my old house. I moved to a what? A brand new place. Now I talk a new talk. I walk a new walk. Dance a new dance. <laughs> Amen. You know, some of you used to boogie to Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Let me leave that alone. <laughs> Number six, the gospel is powered and maintained by the Holy Spirit. Being a Christian is life in the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit. Stepping with the Spirit. Filling with the Spirit. Living in the Spirit. Lowing, reading in the Spirit. If you, the Spirit is not helping you, if the Spirit is not indwelling you, if the Spirit is not filling you, you are not a Christian. It's life in the Spirit. The Greeks call it Soma Pneumaticus. It is body in the spirit. It is flesh in the spirit. That's what changes you. And lastly, remember I'm basing this on Galatians. The gospel is operated in the spirit of God's mercy. And it should affect every Christian. Are you hearing me? The gospel is operated in the spirit of God's mercy. And that shall affect every Christian. I don't understand, brothers and sisters, I don't understand why we call ourselves brothers and sisters and we talk so bad about each other. Tell 
And some of you probably still going to talk bad about me today. You're looking at me innocently right now. And you won't even wait until you get to the parking lot. He went too long today. <laughs> now, what the Bible is actually saying to us, Paul, Paul says this in, in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, and he explained it also in other of the passages. He said, we are Christian. Do you know why you are a Christian? It's because you experience God's mercy. That is the only reason why you are a Christian. If you have been shown mercy, why is it you don't want to show mercy to other people? Especially those who belong to the household of faith. That's why many of our marriages are messed up today. Because even those who are still dating, we're not dating anymore. This is the person that you're so infatuated with. You're so madly in love with. Man, I'll go into the depths of the valley for you. I'll climb Mount Everest for you. <laughs> as long as you agree with everything I say. Let me tell you, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> and that is why we need to go with the principle of the Bible. That when God has joined us together, you hooked. That's it. You live under the principle of operated under the principle of God's mercy. I, I hear some Christians say, I will never forget my, forgive my dad. Either you are not a mature Christian, or you think you are a Christian, you're just fooling yourself. I want you to do this. I want you to keep a diary for one week. In that diary, and after the one week, burn the diary. Because you don't want anybody to see it. I'm telling you that. I guarantee you, you don't want anybody to see it. In that diary, write down everything you think that week. <laughs> Do you know God knows everything you think it? Everything. everything. There's absolutely nothing that's hidden from him and yet he still loves you. Amen. Last point. Last point. Oh, that that was the last point. That was the last point. So we need to understand the gospel what am I saying? The gospel is about forgiveness and restoration. The gospel is about forgiveness and restoration. Sister Huff, can you read Galatians 2.20? Amen. 
Sister Page, Connie Page, Galatians 3, 11. Clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. Amen. Amen. Reggie, Galatians 3, 24, 25. Amen. Rochelle, did she go out? Oh, okay. Uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all in Amen. Did you hear that? Uh, Galatians 3.28. That's what we are. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Judy, Galatians 4. Four and five. But when the time has fully come, God sent his son, born after woman, born under the law, to redeem those who under the law that we might receive the full rights of the son. How how much rights do we have to sonship in God? How do you know that? Do you trust the word of God? Okay. Dick and Matthews, Galatians 5.14. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. I can preach three sermons, but I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> Brother Kwame, Galatians 5.16. So I say, live by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. You should have that in your car, in your house, in your office, in your, what do you call that, uh, cubicle. <laughs> have it everywhere. Key. Galatians 5, 22, 23. Amen. Betty Sue, Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. And man reaps what he sows. Charmaine, Galatians 6, verse 9. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your teaching. We thank, we thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your provision. We praise you for our fellowship. We praise you for our sisterhood and brotherhood. As you've called us today through the message in the praise dance to a higher calling, to your will, to your way we ask that you will make us a church that recognizes that you are in charge help us O Lord to strive toward doing your will and to be satisfied with nothing less we thank you In Jesus' name, amen.